Welcome to Theocast Hot Topics. This is Jimmy. I'm here with John and Justin. And today we are talking about some perhaps some contentious or uh, worthy items of conversation within the realms of Christendom. Now, this is a new part of our membership that we're excited about. And we thought for those of you that are supporting us, and sometimes there are subjects that uh, we don't really want to put out on the on the what do you call it? The pod sphere, the podcast sphere, the pod, <laughs> the pod <word>. feed. <laughs> uh-huh. But we wanted to give you some of our thoughts on it and some, just some, I guess, some perspective. And so that's what is the hot topic. Theocast hot topics is for is that periodically we'll get behind the mic for a couple of minutes just to give you some thoughts on what's going on in culture, entertainment, theology, government. Who knows what we'll talk about? So, Justin, what we got for today? Yeah, so apostasy is always a big deal in the church, and perhaps it's an even bigger deal when a very prominent individual apostatizes, punts the faith, uh, denies Christ. And so many will be familiar with what's been going on with Joshua Harris in recent weeks. Mm -hmm. And so we thought it would be good for the three of us to get behind the microphone and have a conversation today about about his situation, not in detail, but just in in general, a high-profile guy in evangelicalism leaving the faith and heading in a direction that's concerning. Uh, and then we may get into some other some other topics, some other related failures and things of high-profile guys in the pastorate. So we'll see where the conversation takes us, but we'll start with with the Josh Harris piece and and see where this goes. So maybe everybody knows who Josh Harris is. And maybe there are some who are listening to this and like, I have no idea who is that. So, (laughs) so you guys want to answer that? Who is Joshua Harris and why do we care? Yeah. He wrote a book that I've I remember reading when I was in high school. I think, um, how old was Josh when he, when he wrote that when he was 21, 22, something like that. He was young. Yeah. It's called a book. I kissed dating goodbye. And I think it was written with good intentions in mind. He was trying to, mm-hmm. I think, combat a very highly sexual culture within the Christian world. And I think he was trying to offer a perspective that he felt was biblical. And mm-hmm. um, unfortunately, I think the, that, well, not unfortunately, that book ended up blowing up in his face uh, because it, it kind of, and this is not, we're not here to assess the book, but the book didn't really accomplish what he, what he was hoping for it to accomplish. And it, it did cause sure. quite a bit of confusion. There were some people who found the book helpful. So there's a debate on whether it's helpful or not. That's not really what this conversation is about, but it put him on the map uh, along yeah. with the Sovereign Grace Church movement with right. uh, C.J. Mahaney. So that's kind of yeah. who this guy is. And he ended up succeeding C.J. at Covenant Life there in Gaithersburg, Maryland, which is a very large church and was the sort of mothership home church of Sovereign Grace. And so, yeah, he was a, a prominent guy and uh, left the pastorate a few years ago to go pursue more theological studies, was up in the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia studying at Regent, I think, most recently. So mm-hmm. that's a sure. little bit about who Joshua Harris is. And so there have been a lot of strong reactions to what he's been putting up on social media lately and his announcement of, hey, like, based on what I understand the definition of a Christian to be, I am no longer a Christian. And here are some things that I'm wrestling through. And and here's where I'm landing on some issues of sexuality and gender and the like. There have been people like figuratively jumping off the rooftops on multiple sides of this situation and this conversation. And I think what we want to try to do is speak to a couple of different sides of this, hopefully in a reasonable way. And we hope it's profitable for people. Jimmy? Yeah, I believe the first thing that kind of made people really nervous, and rightly so, is that the guy who wrote the Purity Culture book, you know, one day came out, I think, I believe it was an Instagram post announcing his divorce from his wife. Um, And, you know, it was a picture, it was a very, you know, kind of cryptic picture of him and his wife just kind of Mm -hmm. staring into the, the camera. And, you know, they had announced that they were working through a divorce. And then not shortly thereafter, Joshua Harris then released another post on Instagram, you know, saying the things that you said, Justin, that he no longer understood himself to be a Christian. Um, And so, you know, you know, rightly so. I mean, this kind of shakes people because sure. this is this is where everybody's theolo- theological 
framework comes out to play. Um, you know, if you're if you're from a more Arminian mindset, you know, I, you, you're going to say, okay, well, great. He, he, I mean, not great, but he he walked away from the faith. You know, we we believe that he can do that. If if you're if you're of a more uh, Calvinistic ilk, y- you would say, well, perhaps he was never a believer. And so, how do we understand this, guys? I mean, what do we what do we do? So, I think I want to speak to two sides of the aisle here. One, you, you have some people who are acting as though this man has committed the unpardonable sin, and we may as well treat him as though he's dead. And to that crowd, I would just say, hey, like based on a biblical understanding and definition of the unpardonable sin, which is quite strong, I mean, where he would be, he's kind of presenting this as a, hey, I'm wrestling with this, I don't understand myself to be a Christian, the unpardonable sin would be more like, no, nah, I've, I've surveyed all of this, I've tasted and seen of this, and all of this stuff with the church and, and, the, and Christ and all this stuff is of the devil and Jesus can go to hell. That's not what he's saying. And so I think to one side of the aisle, I would say, look, you know, let's, let's pump the brakes, let's calm down for just a moment. Let's not act as though this man could not at some point in the rest of his life come back to the faith, because there have been people throughout history who have denied Christ and have returned to the fold. I mean, even the example we see in Luke 22 of Peter you know, yeah. denying the Lord Jesus in a very volatile, pressure-packed situation, and then obviously coming back you know, to Christ. So, right. that's one side of it that I would want to speak to. I'm, I'm happy to let you guys jump in on that for a second, and then there's another thing that, that I'd want to speak to as well. Yeah, there has to be... Um, the, I, I want to be careful to jump on people, but there's a sense of self-righteousness when you oh, look sure. at a guy like Josh and you look at, I mean, there's even, I mean, he was very affirming of the homosexual crowd and a part of a gay right. pride day. And yep. there's a side of us where we look at and say, how dare he? Um, and then we, you can equate it to all kinds of things like his upbringing, his education, his, was he, was he appropriately qualified as an elder? Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, you can put anything that you want in there. And I'll tell you this right sure. now. You take every seminary in the United States, you take every denomination in the United States, and you have someone who has had an epic failure. I don't Absolutely. care what the seminary is. I don't care yeah. what the denomination is. And the reason is, is that the heart, the human heart is desperately wicked and yeah. has the capacity to do horrible, horrible. And here's the other thing is that the the human heart is also desperately deceitful, meaning that you can Mm -hmm. convince yourself you are a believer when you're not. So I I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that no one is regenerate. No one goes from life to death or death to life uh, by their own works. And so let's say Joshua Harris is not a believer. Well, his apostasy is not a shock to me because he probably grew up in a Christian home. He was trained to think and act and live in a certain way. And when he finally got to a place where the sin was not worth, I mean, the, uh, the, the, what we call the self-righteousness was not worth it to him anymore. He said, forget this. I don't, uh, this is not me. Mm-hmm. I don't look at that and say, if he was trained better, if he had a better education, his education will not make him regenerate. Right. His, Only church, the polity, does his church polity will not make him regenerate. I think one of the things that makes this so brutal is that, you know, Josh Harris, public figure, you know, very well known. Um, A lot of people benefited from his writings, and I would imagine a lot of people benefited from his preaching. And so there, there becomes this massive cognitive dissonance within particularly probably his, his former fold where they're like, Mm -hmm. man, how could a guy who helped me love Christ more, mm-hmm. all of a sudden be so in your face with the things that he's doing now. Because here's the thing, Josh Harris went from this public, you know, to use kind of the, the pokey language, this kind of evangelical thought leader position. And now all of a sudden, he, he's, he's almost kind of rubbing it in with, you, know, you had mentioned John or Justin, you know, partaking in like gay pride events and things like that. And so there's this element where it just becomes that much more painful. And so mm-hmm. I think what's difficult is that if he would have been 
perhaps quiet about this, you know, done this quietly. Some of this conversation we wouldn't be having. Um, but because he's he's seeking to publicize his walk away from the faith, I believe he even has a documentary on hmm. Amazon right now um, that a few sure. of my friends watched and said it's it's pretty, you know, it's pretty grueling. But but yeah, I I, I think to agree with you, Justin, that there there needs to be an element of you know we leave the hidden things to the Lord That's that right. we yeah. the man, secret we things know. belong to Him. Yeah, yeah, we don't we don't know. His story is not over, and and I hate to use that cliche because it makes it sound so Disney. But mm-hmm. <laughs> his life is—he's not dead. No, he that's is right. Not dead. He he has not stood before his creator, and you know, he, like he's still living. And so, I, I think what disturbs me the most—I'm out of all three of us—I'm probably the most active on Twitter. Um, so at Bueller Jimmy. I'm just kidding. I'm, that was that was shameless. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, but, it's fine. It's fine. No, no. Um, but here's the thing. Like, I think the thing that was most difficult for me to watch was was more so, like, Joshua Harris then became everybody's platform. Yeah. He, he like he became everybody's platform to purport their viewpoint of like soteriology or their viewpoint of ecclesiology where all of a sudden it just became like, Hey, this is why I'm part of this denomination because you know, we don't do stuff like this. Yeah. And it's like, right. okay, hold on a minute. Like, yeah. can we just, can we just collectively mourn for a moment together? Right. Right. Yeah, I agree. So on the last comment from me, at least on this, kind of he's not dead yet idea. He may very well be committing the sin that leads to death, like 1 John 5, 16 and 17. But at least based on my perspective, what I've seen and observed, I don't, I don't see him doing that yet. I've seen it happen in a, in a context where like healthy church, a guy who was on staff and all kinds of these things, this dude ends up rejecting the faith and is just so high-handed about it and proud of the fact that like he has rejected Christ, he is the enlightened one and and just stood even in the context of a members meeting where he was being removed from the membership and just was like, you fools don't get it. I mean, it was just, it was absolutely horrifying. Um, I think the sin that is unpardonable that leads to death is obvious when it happens. Perhaps Joshua Harris is committing that, but to, I agree with you, Jimmy, the secret things belong to the Lord. Time will tell on that side of it. This is a little bit personal for me. I have family members who were pastored by Joshua Harris for several years in Maryland. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and wow. so we've had some convos uh, recently in the aftermath of all of this, like, what do we make of it? And one of the things that I've said to them that we all would agree about is that when a man has a failure, whether it's this kind of failure or sexual immorality or whatever it may be, it does not discredit every true thing that he has ever said. Sure. When a when a guy gets in the pulpit or he's writing or something and he says things that are true in accordance with God's word, the Holy Spirit of God is faithful to use that truth to impart faith, sustain faith, and conform people to the image of Jesus Christ. It's not inextricably tethered to that man's character. Not that that man's character doesn't matter, but this is why we don't need to go burning the books of every man who's ever had a failure. And so I think it's helpful for us. Like, (laughs) right. Common sense, yeah, I mean, if right? That's the, and if that's the case, nobody nobody should read Luther. I mean, for some of the things that he <laughs> he wrote later in life. That's true. You know, that's absolutely I, true. I, I mean, and, and I we mean, could say that things, for a number of guys. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's like, man, if we, and this is the thing. I mean, this is the we were talking about this before we actually started recording. I mean, this is the volatility that is Christian social media, where it's yeah. like there is a there is a there is a no mob doubt. mentality that whenever. Like some public figure, you know, has some sort of failing or whenever some public figure says something, it's just like everybody comes out and they're like, I've been waiting, like I've been waiting Mm -hmm. for this moment so I Mm -hmm. can, I can, you know, show people what I really think. And so, I mean, and this is what's difficult because let's just be, let's just be real. It's very difficult to be charitable when you're tweeting. 
It's very yeah. difficult to be charitable when you're commenting because you're not reading body language. You know, you you can you can rarely have some sort of meaningful conversation about a particular issue on a social media platform. And so yeah. and so like I said, when it comes to you know, Joshua Harris, it's just like, hey man, think before you speak. Or or, or dare I say, you know, at the expense of sounding high and holy, like like Pray before you speak, you know, um, pray yeah. before you, I mean, pray for him. I mean, can you, I cannot imagine what this is putting his kids through, you sure. know, his, his family through. Like you think of those, those sheep, as you said, you know, and it sounds like, you know, some Justin, those sheep that listened to him and followed him that knew his voice, like, man, that's hard. You know, the mm-hmm. things, yeah. you know, the the shepherds that are are there and, and watching over them, you know, I can Im- I cannot imagine the work that they're having to do yeah. right now. Yeah, I think pu- public service announcement to even our members and, and others that are engaging from a reform perspective on Twitter, like we talk a lot about compassion and grace and charity. Our theology cultivates and produces that kind of posture. We ought to all strive to to show some of that on social media as well. And so pump the brakes before you just start trying to burn the village down on on a Twitter platform or a Facebook platform. And I agree, man, that 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 arena, that venue is just not the place to try to have a very thoughtful, you know, intricate, nuanced exchange of ideas. It just doesn't lend itself to that. Yeah, I think this is going back to Paul where he says, is not the kindness of God designed to bring you to repentance? And if Joshua is a child of the father, the prodigal story applies where he is prodigaling right now. Amen, bro. He's running running headlong into sin. And our prayer is that the Lord in his kindness will will discipline those whom he loves. And here's the thing. When, when, When the writer of Hebrews says that, we have no time frame. We're not told how mm-hmm. long it takes for the discipline to be in effect. As a matter sure. of fact, the confessions, Rome, or the the confessions, particularly the London Baptist Confession five point yeah. five, says that oftentimes yep. the Lord allows us to remain in sin to yeah. create a greater amount of dependence. So, That's listen, right. our prayer is two things. Our prayer is that the Lord would graciously draw him back in or save him. Uh, but to sit there and judge. That that's 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 a that's a that's a that's a tough one. Yeah. So um, I feel like we've we've spoken about Joshua Harris, but but frankly, you know, he's not he's not an island. Um, he's no. not an isolated incident, if you will. And I don't mean to um, kind of boil him down to to merely that. And so, I mean, again, let let the listener he- hear us rightly. That I think our posture with Joshua Harris is. You know, God is not finished with him, and mm-hmm. and though he has said some painful things, um, and perhaps though he has done some painful things, you know, I think our posture is that of you know we we hope and pray that the Lord restores him, that the Lord restores him to to repentance, yeah. and so I, I think that's that's the posture that that we have. Yeah. So one last comment on on Joshua Harris before we maybe move on to talk about some other stuff. I think that we can, you know, even here at Theocast, we can have a very charitable conversation about about evangelicalism and and maybe uh, how Joshua Harris points to a problem that does exist in that Joshua Harris was thrust into prominence as a very young man because of writing a book about dating. You know, he was sure. not thrust into prominence through the exposition and the expounding of, of God's word. Uh, he wrote a book that I think we could all agree was an overreaction to secular kind of dating culture permeating the church. And like at best, his book contains some common sense, but this is the kind of thing that evangelicalism has tended to hitch its wagon to. It's like, oh yeah, this is what we've been looking for. This is the answer. This is the key. This is what we need to get in the hands of all of our young people. And so now this man is kind of thrown into the spotlight and the limelight at a very young age uh, for something that is, I think we could all agree, is kind of a peripheral issue within Christianity. And so that's an observation that I think can be made and should be made. 
though I want to sure. make it with charity and not just like burn everything down uh, with respect to Joshua Harris or his denomination, his tradition, and all of that kind of thing. And I'm not saying that everything in evangelicalism is wrong, but that tendency to elevate a man like Joshua Harris for writing a book like that is less than good. And so right. I'm done kind of like you guys. I think we're done talking about Joshua Harris. Let's, let's take this in a different direction. Yeah, so there's also, you know, as I said earlier, he's not, he's not isolated. There, I mean, there's also By a no few names. other names. Yeah, there's also a few other names, you know, very public names, let's just say in the past year or two, where there have been some very grievous uh, sins committed. Um, you know, so we think of Talin Chavijan, you know, Mark Driscoll, uh, you know, James McDonald, where, I mean, there's, there's been some writing and articles and uh, things that have come to light, you know, three very Well, you could throw in musicians in there men. too. Like, oh, like sure. Gunger Hillsong. And, yeah, yeah, Hillsong. Yeah. Yeah, Michael Gunger, Marty Sampson, you know. But I, I'm particularly even, like, thinking... Derek Webb in recent years too, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah the the yeah. Camden's Call guy. Yeah. So yeah. I'm particularly thinking of these three pastors that, you know, when I, when I was in really when I was being formed, you know, in the, in the doctrines of Calvinism, if you will, you know, I mean, these three names, Tullian, uh, Driscoll, McDonald, I mean, they were very prominent. Um, this was kind of right when the gospel coalition was being formed, you know, T4G was being formed. Uh, and these three guys, you know, were so popular amongst the crowds that I ran in you know, people flocked to them and their teaching. Um, but, you know, with Tullian, extramarital affair, Driscoll, you know, just a, a, a posture of, of bullying. Uh, McDonald, you know, the same thing. And I mean, I think McDonald was even, you know, quoted. Well, he's under investigation of, right now. Right. Of, of you know, trying yeah. to put a hit out on somebody. So, I mean, just, I mean, things that just kind of cause your head to spin and and John, I remember you know, John is helping us plant a church, and I remember I was sitting in a Starbucks reading some of this McDonald's stuff, and it just it was like a, a rock falling on my chest, and I remember calling John and just said, John, John, like what do you, how do we, what do we do, like how do you even think about this, and how do we not get there as because you're, I mean, you're listening to three guys in the ministry, and so how. What do we do, mm -hmm. John? What I mean, what did you tell me in that moment, if you remember? <laughs> I do remember. Yeah, I think that it's there's always a danger within our heart, and it, and it's you you constantly live in that fear of like how how do I say this without uh, sounding more morbid? I live in a constant fear of failure because I know how weak and frail I am. So my mm -hmm. elders are they are. <sighs> They are so important to me. My mm -hmm. my friendship with you three are, is so important to me because if you do not, what happens is is that in the in that type of a culture, these guys get so powerful, and they become these cash cows where they draw all this money. And there's this where basically, if if I walk away, these organizations crumble, mm -hmm. and pride easily builds up into that. I think you know the you look at guys like R.C. Sproul. Thank the Lord from what we know. I mean, R.C. Burl's ministry was probably one of the largest in the reform world, brought in more money than mm -hmm. probably all of the other guys combined. And thankfully, the Lord protected him from that. Amen. But I think there's a side of it where um, we have to live in that posture of, if you don't think it's possible, like Jimmy, like when I, what I told you, Jimmy, I said, this is healthy. It means you're aware of it. it you're going to be looking for it. And, and it's, uh, you have to put your, surround yourself with elders who are going to confront it when they see it. Yeah, I, I think that a, a few things here. We recently recorded a podcast, episode 181, The Dark Side of Christianity. That podcast, in part, was birthed out of this kind of conversation that we were having on your porch, John, about yeah. the darkness that exists in all of us, about how all of us as ordinary people and ordinary pastors even are capable of extraordinary evil. And so I think that it's entirely right and appropriate that we would have a very conscious posture when we hear about failures, like we've mentioned, that it, were it not for the grace of God, there go I. Yeah. So that's that matters a ton. 
but then you know also like even in in the spirit of like Galatians 6 1 you know where we're told that when people are caught in sin those who are spiritual should restore those people in a spirit of gentleness but keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted it's like well that word right there is hey as you're seeking to even restore people who've been caught in sin be aware of your own frame Sure. And realize that it would be incredibly easy for you to go the same way. And so that's really important for us as pastors to, to be aware of these things and be aware of our own frames and our own frailties. And John, I agree with you, man. One of the great benefits of having a plurality of elders in a local church is that you pastor each other. Like you have these very intimate relationships. You know one another's lives really well. I know that one of the goals on our eldership is to create that kind of intimacy and that kind of safeness, if I can use that word, where we can be very real with one another about the bends in our own frames and how our marriages are doing, how our families are doing. Hey, man, like here's something I'm struggling with right now. Be aware of it. And I think that's absolutely critical and essential for a man's ministry. Yeah. And I think um, this is part of the problem that necessarily, I think, boils up when you approach the Christian life with this posture of we always have upwards trajectory. We, we're always going to have victory. You know, sin is always going to become less and less of an issue rather than approaching the Christian life, even from, you know, an elder pastor standpoint that the inner war rages. You know, I have a, I have a dear friend of mine who, I mean, I just, He's not a pastor, but I think the way he thinks of the pastorate is so helpful. Um, you know, one of the things he always says is, you know, I pray for my pastor because the law and the devil have been working very, very hard on him all week, you know? Amen. Um, and I just find that so helpful because, and just, I mean, if you're a listener and you're not, you're not in full-time vocational ministry, um, that you just, you're, you, you, I don't want to say you're just a church member, but y- you are a church member just be so mindful of that, that that your pastor struggles in unique ways that you do not, um, that not only is he a follower of Christ, but he's also an under shepherd of Christ. And with that comes added responsibility and added accountability. And because of that, when he sins and he's aware of it, when he sins and, and he's aware of it, man, the, the shame and the guilt can be just hurled upon him from the law and and from from Satan. And so, I mean, just to be mindful of his frame, be mindful of his weaknesses. And I think this is why us uh, us as three guys, you know, uh, we can maybe talk about this in a, a future podcast. You know, Luther's understanding of theology of the cross, theology of glory. You know, yeah. where you know, being a theologian of the cross, you know, you're not seeking the ministry because of fame and what it can bring you. Um, you're not seeking it for position and power and influence, but, but rather, you know, God calls us to the ministry because he wants to use us in order to lead people to not ourselves, but, but rather to Christ. I'm going to follow up to that. I'm going to follow up to an answer to the question, Jim, you originally asked me and I made this observation a while back and, and unfortunately it's, it's uh, an observation that I've had to make for a long time now, trying to put my finger on how someone could preach a message like Tulian. Grace, Tulian mm-hmm. had a, a large impact on my life and understanding grace and the development of grace. But there was something in his message that, that bothered me and that was missing. And I would say this would be true about the other two men as well, Driscoll and McDonald. Their ecclesiology, I do not feel is a very biblical or nor reformed historic understanding of the function and how the church is supposed to work. And what I mean by that is they uh, preach a message that is very individualized to go off of what Jimmy just said. It's, it's about the personal mm-hmm. life. And what happens with these men is that it becomes one, they become a public figure, they become a celebrity pastor, and it becomes their Christian communication to the broader Christian world. They're not a churchman. They aren't a man who is submitting themselves to the church. And I would say every man around this mic, the priority is gospel church. Like you have to keep those in that order because if you don't, yeah. the gospel then loses its effect on your life. So I would say, and I think it's fair if you were to go assess what they wrote, if they, if they, you assessed 
um, what they said, you would see that the church and the function of the church was very much disconnected from their gospel ministry of, of how they would apply it. Yeah. I think something that we may talk about down the road is just the pastoral ministry and even a pastor's life, uh, even his holiness and his godliness. There is some stuff said sometimes it's unhelpful with respect to some of that. But Jimmy, I just wanted to to pick up sort of where you left off a minute ago, man, in thinking about the the burdens that a pastor can feel. I think this is good for people to be aware of. We too, like you've already acknowledged, we're just like everybody else. We are standing in the merit and righteousness of Christ alone, not on our own merit, not on our own strength. We are in the same desperate position of need as everybody that we are preaching to is in. And so we're just like our congregations are. And I know that for me, and I know if this is true for the two of you guys, I strive to not build a ministry on a public persona of having it all together. And I think it's important for us and for the longevity of our ministries to be able to exist in a church culture where we can be transparent and honest about things. I mean, for example, I mean, there are a number of Sunday mornings where I feel the weight of my own corruption. I, I'm feel, I'm like, man, what a what a prideful man I am. What an anxious guy I oh, can yeah. be. I can be. A, I can fear men in all these terrible ways. You know, frustration and anger, or you know, lust or whatever it is. I mean, these things just kind of rear their ugly heads at points, and yeah. you're just like, man, you know, you you you're aware of that, and then the devil jumps on that man, and it's like how in the world are you qualified to go and preach to God's people and lead his church? That's right. And, yeah. and so it's, it's important. I mean, pray for your pastor, but also help your pastor create a culture in your local church where it's okay for the pastor to have a bad day and be able to talk to people about that with discretion, yeah. of course, but it's good to be able to walk into an assembly and somebody ask you how you're doing. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not doing that well. And here's what's going right. on. And we're all here because of Christ. And I'm excited to look to him alongside you. Yeah. So w- with that being said, uh, perhaps the the logical question is, all right, so maybe everybody's waiting for us to answer this question. Tullian, Driscoll, McDonald, are these guys disqualified for ministry? It's a good question. Currently, yes. <laughs> yeah, Currently, right? yes. yes. Currently, yeah. yeah. They they are not without, you know, they are they they their reputation is you know, for, you know, I mean, there, each one of them has failed one of the qualifications sure. of, of an elder. So right. yeah, go ahead. Joe. Well, and as much as, yeah, as much, so, I, I just, I don't know. I, I feel like Tullian and McDonald has been a little bit more public um, and perhaps ignorance on my end. I mean, I'm just not sure where things kind of landed with Driscoll in his previous context and body, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. So I think the way that I would answer this is right now, they are disqualified in part because as we do look at the older qualifications laid out in first Timothy three and Titus one, those are often overly spiritualized, which is another conversation for another time. But what they describe is a man who is worthy of trust. They describe a man who in one sense lives a life worthy of imitation. And it's like, Hey, this is describing a guy that we would all be happy to follow. And so in, in the spirit of what Paul is writing in those two pastoral epistles, I think that these three guys that we're talking about right now clearly would not fit those criteria because it's it's so fresh. It's so recent. It's in some cases pretty heinous and demonstrable. It's been public. And so to say, oh yeah, that, you know, Tullian or James McDonald or Mark Driscoll, that's clearly a guy that I can trust. That's clearly a guy that I would want to follow and imitate his life is is just not something that I think anybody would say. And so that's where we're coming from, that at least for a season, a man is disqualified from ministry. I personally don't understand one sin to disqualify a man from ministry forever necessarily, because I think no. if he demonstrates repentance, humility, you know, contriteness, things like that over a season of time, and in one sense is able to rebuild trust that has been broken and is able to sort of reestablish a life by God's grace in the spirit where people are like, yeah, I think I think that I would want to follow that man in part because of how he's handled his failure. I think that's entirely legitimate. And so, right. uh, yeah, it just seems yeah. a little bit hasty and premature 
with these three guys that we're talking about that they're already back in ministry. Yeah. I, I mean, at the same time, there are particular sins. You know, I'm, I'm just going to use Tullian for an example. I mean, in one instance, you know, having an extramarital, extramarital affair with a member of his congregation, being yeah. restored to a position of authority and then do it in, doing it again. Oh, yeah. I'm just like, yeah. bro, like, I just don't think this is for you. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, no, I, you, no disagreement at all. Right. Like you need to go pursue in terms some, of a pattern. some, some honorable work elsewhere. Now, um, and I'm not airing anyone's dirty laundry because he wrote a book about it. You know, I think somebody uh, worth exploring um, is Chad Bird. Like for, for the listener. Yeah. Um, sure. I mean, Chad, you know, go read his book, Night Driving, where he talks about the that's heinous really sins good. he committed while in ministry. Which and, we're going to interview soon. That's right. Mm-hmm. Kaka the bird. Um, you know, we <laughs> <laughs> nobody calls him that, but for me. Um, but but I think he, you know, I think there is a a model to be looked at where, you know, Chad is not in full-time ministry. I mean, he works a a noble job. Uh he writes uh for, you know, the Christian world. Um does some speaking, but you know, he's mm-hmm. not shepherding a local congregation, but right. works a noble job of truck driving, you know? Yeah. Um, where I think for so many of these men, what's difficult is that they commit these sins and then they just, you know, it's the idea of rebranding. You know, I'm just going to go out and um, all my all my haters can hate, but I'm just going to go do my thing, you know? Yeah, there's, so to, uh, before we wrap this up, I'll say, uh, Jimmy, does Jimmy is very qualified. Uh, there's nothing in our, in our life, in his life that our elders found, but I would treat Jimmy the same way I would treat Chad or any of these other guys is that I don't believe you just go plant a church. I believe churches plant churches. So I think right. if these men, yeah. we would treat, helpful. we would treat, yeah, we would treat Chad or Tulian or any of these other men just the way we treated Jimmy, where we would interview him and look at his life and look at the people that we know and say, Hey, listen, as he stands right now, not where he was in the past, but as he stands right now, does he have a reputation that mm-hmm. meets the qualifications of an elder? We're not saying he's perfect, um, but what we are saying is that, like, listen, why can you make sins that are egregious while an unbeliever and then still be a pastor, but yet be make have egregious sins while a believer and then not be a pastor? And my point on that is that it just depends on what the sin is, right? There are certain sins that you just you're never going to gain trust back from because uh, just you just can't do it. Just there's some cultural things that just aren't going to work. But on certain some of these sins, it's, we can. And I think elders need to assess, look, and and I think qualify whether these men are ready or not. That that's what I would feel is the most biblical mm-hmm. way to handle. And I don't think. From what I've seen, I mean, McDonald's is still on a spiral, but these guys, I don't feel like have done that. I could be wrong. Someone could correct. Yeah, they're, they've kind of gone, I mean, it's a cliche phrase. They've sort of gone rogue and kind of done their yeah. own thing. Yeah. And and that's always a concern uh, when that guy is just kind of making the decision by himself that I'm ready to resume full-time ministry, vocational ministry. I think you're spot yeah. on, John. I think, Jimmy, you've made good observations about patterns of sin, you know, like Tullian as an example, like, hey, man, had this happen once, okay, but now that this can, seems to be a pattern that just keeps rearing its ugly head, perhaps you need to think about a different vocation and still do what you can to, to love and serve the local church. I think that's right, wise, yeah. and I think it's good counsel. Yeah. Well, guys, I think this has been a helpful conversation, and I think to kind of bring things to summation is, you know, as we think about guys that are walking away or seem to be making a shipwreck of their faith, you know, the, the Joshua Harris you know, the different names, it's important to remember, one, we do treat them. We do treat them based off of today. And so some of the, we tr- I, in my opinion, I think we treat Joshua Harris like an unbeliever, you know, yep. like I wouldn't ask him to come speak at my church. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Yeah, absolutely. If he came and said, I want to be a member at your church, I'd say, well, brother, based on the things that you've said online, no, you know, I mean, you're just going to, you're going to hurt this, this body. Uh, but at the, uh, on the other end of that token, I think, you know, we we do pray that the Lord restores him. And then when it comes to these other guys, you know, Tully and Driscoll McDonald, man, I think this is so important to remember to the pastor is that, man, you do not have to be famous. You do not have to have a large following. 
to fall into these sins. And so I don't want to equate, well, just because these guys were famous, that's why they did things like that. Like, man, Mm -hmm. there are guys that pastor 30 people that can be just as susceptible to some of the heinous things that these men have committed. And so it's always important to remember the, the piece of accountability, of transparency, of like, if you're a pastor and you're struggling, like, that needs to be known to your elders <laughs> um, and and you need to develop a, a culture of safety and trust. Um, so, I mean, this has been a, a sobering hot topic and, and we hope to discuss more of these things in the future. And again, we, we don't want to just simply give our hot takes on this. You know, our hope, again, is to encourage the weary pilgrim to rest in Christ. And so we encourage you to listen to some of our other episodes, see some of the resources that we put out. I mean, John has a helpful little uh, article in our free ebook, you know, A Primer on Rest, where he talks about fighting sin from the posture of rest that would be worth taking a look at. And so we hope you enjoyed this conversation. We're excited to continue to bring you content like this. So thank you to our members for supporting us. We couldn't be doing what we're doing without your support. Uh, So We hope and pray this has been helpful to you and that you share and support us continually in the future.